Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 240 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Have you ever had one of those really interesting conversations where the person you were talking to was just so fascinating that you wish it didn't have to end? Well, I had a conversation like that last year for this podcast. Normally, I speak with guests about history, but Flora Frazier and I had a chance to talk about biography. And in doing so, she told me what it was like to grow up as the daughter and granddaughter of two famed British biographers. And Flora just knows a lot about the genre of biography and how it developed in the United Kingdom. Now, I interviewed Flora for episode 209, the first episode in the Doing History biography series. That series really allowed us to explore the genre of biography and how the genre of biography relates to and is different from the genre of history. Plus, we also explored how historians and biographers can best uncover and understand the lives of people from the past. Well, I thought this was a really interesting conversation, and it was really unfortunate that Flora and I got to talk for nearly an hour and I could only use about 20 minutes of the conversation in episode 209. So I saved our full conversation, hoping that one day I'd have an opportunity to share it with you. Well, today that opportunity has arrived. I'm out of town this week, and I needed a great episode that I could put together for you on short notice. And this works out for both of us, because again, Flora Frazier is a really fascinating person, and she has so much information and wisdom to share about biography and what it's like to be part of a family of biographers. So just like with last week's episode, I've dispensed with our usual introductory and concluding remarks, and I offer you a conversation you've heard part of, but not all of. And I really think you're going to enjoy all of it. Now, Flora Fraser is a professional writer and biographer. She grew up in London and Scotland and studied classics at Oxford University. She's the founder of the Elizabeth Longford Prize for Historical Biography, and she's currently writing a biography of Flora MacDonald, an 18th century Scottish heroine who became embroiled in the American Revolution. Previous to this work, Flora has published five biographies, including The Princesses, The Daughters of King George III, and most recently, The Washingtons. George and Martha joined in friendship, crowned in love, which won the George Washington Book Prize in 2016. And now, I hope you enjoy this extended conversation with Flora Fraser. Thank you for joining us, Flora Frazier. Now, you're a professional biographer, and I wonder, what sparked your great interest in biography? It really goes back to my childhood, I think you could say, because growing up between London and Scotland in the 1960s, I was an avid reader, and there was a golden age of historical fiction for children. That's children between the ages of, I would say, six and 11. Our local library had a wonderful series called The Young Horatio Nelson, The Young Florence Nightingale, The Young Queen Victoria, The Young Elizabeth Fry. So my sister and I would ferry these books back and forward to our local library, reading through the entire series, but also reading stories from British history, whether it was Scottish history of the 18th century or Tudor history. So that was very character driven, the fiction that I read as a child. And at home, my mother, a historical biographer, read to us when we were young and then we read for ourselves British history classics for children, Our Island Story by Henrietta Marshall. Generations of British children grew up on this, had very good color illustrations. And for younger children, there was Eleanor Fargin's Kings and Queens. So all around, in a sense, there was history. Also, my parents, with six children to entertain, were very keen on cheap entertainment. And castles, which had moats to roll down and cannons to climb on, in the 60s, they were generally free 
so we spent a lot of time going to castles in England and in Scotland and battlefields. We were never out of a battlefield. And our parents, my mother, English, my father, Scottish, would tell us the stories with great enthusiasm of the people who lived and fought in these places. So I was very alive to the history of the British Isles growing up. And in Scotland, of course, there's the Jacobite history, and we lived close to the battlefield of Culloden, where Bonnie Prince Charlie was defeated by George II's son, the Duke of Cumberland, who was known in Scotland as Butcher Cumberland. So it was, in a way, a childhood very rich in history. Even in junior school, we were taught the history of the Tudors over and over again throughout junior school. So it came as rather a surprise on reaching senior school to learn about historical movements like the Industrial Revolution, which didn't actually involve either the Tudors or they weren't character driven. So I think I naturally approach history through the medium of biography. And of course, my childhood and youth was writing biography, Mary Queen of Scots, Charles II, and my grandmother, Elizabeth Longford, was producing Life of Queen Victoria from papers in the Royal Archives and a Life of the Duke of Wellington from papers at the Duke's home. So I knew that books came out of study of individuals and that if you studied these individuals for long enough, a book came out of it. And then you, in a sense, moved on to another person to study. I was like someone who born into a family of makers of widgets or family firm who all are in the business of making, let's say, furniture. And my choice was to join that family firm or reject it. And I made quite a good living as a teenager and then later after university researching for my mother and grandmother and other writers. You couldn't then in the 70s and 80s electronically check all the bibliographical details that you need, place of publication when you're citing a book, a date of publication, nor could you check a quote. You had to go to the British Library and physically check that quote. And I was very happy to do this for an hourly rate. So I rather thought that that's what it took to write a book. And when I came to research my first book after university, A Life of Emma Hamilton, Lady Hamilton, Nelson's Mistress, I found the research, I don't mean no problem, but enjoyable. And my mother and grandmother taught me very well how to do research. And then, of course, I experienced complete creative chaos when it came to turning my research into a book. And all the research tumbled around in my head for months before I found a way through to commit it to paper in the form of chapters. So I did think of other careers. I very much wanted to become a barrister when I was in my teens and even at university. But I married a barrister while I was still at Oxford. And so I sort of didn't want to be lagging behind. And there was a recession in the UK in the 1980s when I finished university. It was very difficult to find jobs. So I rather fell into writing biography. But 35 years later, I'm very glad that I did because I wake up every morning full of enthusiasm for what I do. Wow. It sounds like you had a very character-driven childhood. And that's something about biography, right? The people we research in uses windows onto the past really make the past seem character-driven. Like, you get a better understanding about the castles and the battlefields you visit because you really have a feel for the human side, the people who lived in those castles and who fought on those battlefields. Yes. And another way I think you get a feel for the person is 
by reading what they have written or what their contemporaries have written about them. It varies. Some of the people I've written about have been tremendous letter writers, and others, there are periods in their life their letters don't survive. But you can turn to the diaries and letters of others with descriptions of them. And what I, in all my books, have tried to be is a kind of midwife to bring the voices of these characters. And I write about women principally and some men in the 18th century to bring their voices onto the page for the 20th, 21st century reader to really hear their voices. I think that's one of the most important things that one can do as a biographer going into archives and finding those voices. Of course, as the biographer, you read an enormous amount of correspondence, if you're so lucky that your subject has written. And then, of course, you can quote, let's say, a tiny portion of what they have written. But you want to both give them a voice in the modern age. And of course, you want to interpret that voice for your reader and to sort of my narrative as I'm telling the life of the women I write about is to give a context to these women's lives, the broader historical context, give her the times in which they lived. And there's that interesting balance between how far did their character drive the events of their lives? And was it just circumstance which drove the lives? Were they passive? Were they active? And so all of the women that I've written about were involved in great national conflicts. So Emma Hamilton lived and was caught up with Admiral Nelson, her lover, in the Napoleonic Wars. Martha Washington, of course, who I wrote about the marriage of George and Martha Washington. And Martha was at headquarters every winter of the war with her husband and all his aides de camp, including, of course, Alexander Hamilton, of whom we now, <laughs> in whom we now take a tremendous and just interest after the success of Hamilton, the musical. But Martha's interaction with others besides Alexander Hamilton, with Henry and Lucy Knox, a Boston bookseller who became a great artillery officer in Washington's army, Queen Caroline, George IV's wife, who I've written about. Her father was one of the heroes on the other side fighting in the Napoleonic Wars. And of course, the daughters of George III, the six daughters who I've written about, lived with their father through the American Revolution as seen from the British side. So in my books, there's national conflict, at least in the background, and there are strong male figures in my life of Pauline Bonaparte. Of course, her brother, the Emperor Napoleon, is frankly the person she loves most, more than either of her husbands. And so it, I write about 18th century women because they were for a long time ignored the idea of soft power or influence wasn't appreciated as it is now. In the 19th century, when biographers were writing about all the male figures I've mentioned, it was the man and the monument and the monumental achievements which were the focus of biography and the private lives which interest us today as much as the monumental achievements, were not thought fit for these material for biographies. So I write about women in a sense because the women of the 18th century have not received their due. And the women I've written about, and it's always a haphazard business, who you fix on to write about next. But some of them have stood out to me as rather like 
icicles standing up. I think that's stalagmites rather than stalactites that fall down because they don't fit with, if you like, the run of the mill women, be they royal or be they commoners of the period. And Queen Caroline, Pauline Bonaparte were, you could say, almost bizarre women, but that attracted me to see what their lives were like, how they dealt having these uncommon characters with others who were more conventional. You mentioned that all the women you've researched and written about were involved in great periods of national conflict. And typically, when we study great periods of national conflict, we usually do so by viewing them through the eyes of men. So how does viewing these periods through the eyes of women change how we view these events? Yes. The most obvious example, I suppose, is viewing the Napoleonic Wars through the eyes of Napoleon's sister Pauline, because as a result of the French wars and that long period from the French Revolution in 1789 to the defeat of Napoleon in 1815, Pauline was sent off to Haiti with her husband to recover the sugar empire for France. Her husband died there of yellow fever. So that is a conflict in which she's having to manage as a wife and then a widow and shows enormous bravery in this hideous conflict where Haiti, having been free, is now being recovered by the French with the aid of Pauline's husband, the general who leads the expedition. And then she remarries and becomes Princess Borghese, marries an Italian prince. And then she is there to sustain her brother when he's defeated in 1814 and sent to Elba. And she, alone of the many brothers and sisters who've profited from the empire and they've been made kings of Spain and queens of Naples, she goes to Elba and is there to comfort and also to keep up the imperial, if you like, pretense in this tiny island of Elba, which he's been exiled to. And later, after he's exiled and never returns from Mount St. Helena in the Atlantic, Pauline, who's leading a fairly comfortable life in Rome, hears that he's gravely ill and writes to the British Prime Minister, he's a British prisoner out in St. Helena, and says that she wishes permission to go to St. Helena, this tiny Parisian creature, but she's got Corsican fiery blood in her. And she says, but she will first come into London so as to obtain a wardrobe, by which she doesn't mean a piece of furniture, but <laughs> as it were, a trousseau to dress for St. Helena before she can actually go out to St. Helena. News comes that Napoleon has died, but she follows his fortunes throughout his rise and then his fall as closely, really, as if she were a general on the battlefield. So they're off stage. They're not generals. They're not prime ministers, these women I write about. But in the 18th century, there were no government offices to go to until the end of the century. Men, whatever their positions, worked at home which is why we still have 10 Downing Street. Simply, it was a prime minister's townhouse. And so the women in the 18th century are very much there for the decisions taken over the dining table late afterwards, over the tea table. They're with their husbands, with if they're the sisters or the daughters. They're there while decisions are being made. The 19th century, which sees this division between the female sphere and the male sphere, doesn't exist. And for that reason, the 18th century is very interesting just because you have the women so closely involved in the decision making at a higher level. At some point earlier in our conversation, you mentioned that 
women weren't seen as fit material for biography during the 19th century. And this really raises a question about the traditions of biography. Would you tell us about the tradition of biography in the United Kingdom and how you see the evolution of that tradition taking place over time? Yes, that's a very interesting question, because in this country, there was this long classical tradition. So, you know, the elite really studied Latin and Greek and not much else. The men at the schools, now the famous schools, Eton, Winchester, Westminster in the 18th century. So Greek and Roman texts like Plutarch's Parallel Lives of Greeks and Romans, that continued, if you like, to influence the first group biography, if you like. And on the continent, there was Vasari's Lives of the Artists, another group biography. And here in the 17th century, John Aubrey wrote his brief lives about his 17th century contemporaries. So those were early, I mean, we're talking you know, across the centuries, but those were early biographical works, but which were much admired. And as time went on, and there were other, obviously, great classical lives written in antiquity, but as time went on, you have these biographies written by men, some of them academics, but most of them men of letters rather than academics, amateurs, if you like, or independent scholars, one might call them now. And there were a number of hugely influential biographies which set the bar, I suppose. And Carlyle's Life of Frederick the Great. Later, there was Lytton Strachey's Eminent Victorians. So these were biographies still extremely readable, but they were concerned with the man and the monument. And I would say that my mother, Antonia Fraser, and my grandmother, Elizabeth Longford, were in a wave of female biographers who went into archives in the 1960s and produced lives of women. My mother has written on Marie Antoinette, as well as Mary Queen of Scots. My grandmother produced Queen Victoria, but she also produced the marvelous two-volume biography of the Duke of Wellington. So they were writing about men as well as women, great and famous queens and empresses. Yes, there have always been biographies of Elizabeth I. But my mother and grandmother were interested as wives and mothers themselves by the private side of the men and women they were writing about. And that new tradition continued. More recent books by Stella Tilliard, Aristocrats, and Amanda Foreman, Georgina, Duchess of Devonshire, dealt again both with the political and the private. So a new style, if you like, of biography, I think it's fair to say, emerged. And male biographers also focused more on the private as well as the public side of their lives. And now there's absolutely you know, no difference. Men write about women, women write about men. But the other development, which I would say has taken place in British historical biography, I can't speak to literary biography. I'm not qualified to talk about it. I enjoy literary biography, but I've never attempted to write one. And historical biography has always been in this country for the general reader. It's always aimed at the general reader. Anyone, in a sense, can write a historical biography. There's only one rule of engagement, if you like, for a biographer, is that anyone with a maybe a high school education, but not even that much, must be able to enjoy and fully comprehend the biography. So it's not for the specialist. It really is designed for the general reader. And that's a sort of implicit rule when you look at all the new biographies on the shelves of bookstores. They're all 
absolutely accessible to anyone. There used to be, I think it's fair to say, a prejudice in academe against historical biography as a way of presenting history. And that, I think, lingered on until maybe the 1980s. I was kind of conscious of it when I began writing. And now those barriers have come down and you're just as likely to find a wonderful biography written by a professor at a university as by an independent scholar in this country. And that's been, a, I think, in part a product of the new accessibility of archives. I think it's also a response to a curious reading public who want to have the latest research, which perhaps someone at a university is more likely to be aware of. So there's a sort of interplay now between independent scholars and academics who are all interested in each other's work. You've touched on this a bit throughout our entire conversation, but would you take us through your process of writing a biography? When you're trying to tell the life of someone, how do you go about telling their life, you know, getting into their head and conveying their life to your readers? I believe that there is no better arc to a biography than starting with the cradle and ending at the grave. Others have different approaches, but I also do like to get into the story if there's no evidence for the earlier life. I try not to use the two words would have. In other words, writing a sentence like, she would have felt delighted to see him. I mean, I don't think I'd ever have written that. So I'm interested in what we know, not in what I'm imagining this person might have felt. So I'm quite rigorous about taking, at the end of my research, what I actually know about this woman's life and setting it out. But into that comes a great deal of research. I research all the places. I mean, I'm a great one for footstep research. So I go around as far as possible everywhere that my subject is known to have gone where possible. Although I'm I'm quite glad that Pauline Bonaparte didn't get to St. Helena because that would have been quite a journey. But when I was writing Emma Hamilton, who lived as the wife of the British ambassador in Naples for many years, I spent many two-week periods in Naples and in the surroundings where her life took her. And it wasn't only going to the individual places, it was to be there where she had been. And of course, you look at the scenery through rose-tinted glasses because you're imagining it as it was in that case in the 1780s. But that's you're imagining it with the aid of a great deal of study of paintings, of descriptions, either by her or by hundreds of travelers to Naples in that period. So you're building up a picture, you're mooring them in their life, in their surroundings, so that you, as far as possible, come to know the place, if possible, in which Martha Washington received a letter or her correspondence with George Washington, although they wrote to each other constantly. They burnt it by design so that it would remain a private matter forever. And so my book about their marriage is an oblique look at their marriage. A few letters do exist, but it was one in which I consulted from my desk in London the electronic Washington papers, which are wonderful and all online, all searchable. And then I tramped all the winter headquarters of the war and visited, of course, New York and Philadelphia, where they were during the presidential years. So you build up almost a three-dimensional portrait of their life, and that 
informs your writing. And it's hard to say how it does inform your writing, but it gives you the certainty with which to write. And it does mean that you rule out fancy. And by fancy, I mean these speculatory remarks like he would have felt great joy to receive her letter. I mean, we have absolutely no idea. So let's not go there. I will speculate about other matters, how Admiral Lord Nelson could have brought himself with Emma to be so cruel to the wife he left, how George IV could bring himself to be so vindictive to his wife, Queen Caroline, and how could Queen Caroline be so unmaternal as to leave her daughter and go abroad? I mean, those things are areas where I do speculate. So, yeah, I think a great deal, and I do research for probably a minimum of two years before I come to write. And when I write, it takes me ages to get going. I've just written chapter one of a new book about Flora MacDonald, a Scottish heroine who helped save Bonnie Prince Charlie in Scotland in the 1740s, and then 30 years later emigrated to North Carolina and was caught up in the American Revolution. And I owe everything to my editor, Robert Gottlieb of Knopf in New York, who took me on when I was 21 or two, when I was beginning writing Emma Hamilton. And he continues to encourage and edit, but he did reject three versions of chapter one before he finally accepted chapter one recently. So I am now on to chapter two. One of the things I find so interesting about your career is that you've written the biographies of many different types of royal women, princesses, queens, ladies. And then you wrote this biography about George and Martha Washington. And I wonder, in what ways did the historical sources we have about say, the Washingtons and someone who was royal, how do they differ from each other? Do we have different records for royals and non-royals? And do you have to interpret those records differently? Yes. I spent 15 years researching consecutively the lives of the six daughters of George III and then the life of their sister-in-law, Queen Caroline, the wife of their brother, George, Prince of Wales, later the Prince Regent, and subsequently George IV. So I spent 15 years researching their lives in the Royal Archives at Windsor. And the archives are housed in the Round Tower, which goes back to William the Conqueror. So it's quite a historic place in itself. And the Royal Archives have papers going back to the reign of George III, and they come forward to the reign of our current queen. Earlier royal papers are in our national archives near Kew Gardens. Between the two books and spending 15 years sort of researching and writing one and researching and writing the other, I came to know the Georgian papers, as they're called, which include the papers of George the first, second, third, fourth, and William the fourth. I came to know them fairly well and could sort of go backwards and forwards between bundles and boxes. But I was driving down every day and asking for boxes. And it was very physical, if you like, and hugely enjoyable and a privilege. When I came to write about George and Martha Washington, it was extraordinary because I would log on via my computer to the George Washington papers, which the University of Virginia and Mount Vernon between them have all but finished putting online. And, you know, there was no drive, there were no boxes. And yes, it was transcription. So I wasn't looking at original handwriting. And I wasn't making out some of that very bad handwriting. It was a different experience. And the Washington Papers have superb footnotes 
essays to accompany the papers. It was a marvelous experience. Both were marvelous experiences, very different. I did, of course, with all three books, with the two royal books and with the Washingtons, also go to different archives, the Virginia Historical Society, the Library of Congress for George Marth Washington, to number of important private archives for the lives of the princesses and of Queen Caroline. So it is apples and pears, but it comes down to the same thing. I'm still on the whole with archives looking at letters from one correspondent to another. And I have this belief after 35 years of researching in archives that on the whole, people lie less in letters to each other than they lie in diaries. Because in a diary, certainly memoirs, you know, in a memoir, you can write what you want. But even in a diary, people will you know, elaborate or perhaps embellish their own part in events. In letters, there's a truth in letters that it's the raw material of lives. And I think there's a certain respect for your correspondent. There's also sometimes the knowledge that that correspondent, if they're a close friend, close relation, going to know if you're not telling the truth. And above all, you're communicating. You write a letter because you want to communicate something. So there can be lies, but there's usually something important to communicate. And so I'm a great fan of reading correspondence in any form, really, whether it's driving down the M4 to Windsor or logging on to the Washington Papers at home. It's really clear when we hear you talk about your process, Flora, that you believe that thorough research makes for good writing and good biographies. But I wonder about the role of objectivity. When historians approach their historical research and writing, they try to do so with objectivity. And I wonder, do biographers likewise approach historical research and writing with objectivity? Yes. I think as a biographer, you have a role as a champion of your subject, but a critical champion, if that's possible, in that you want to tell their life and not the life of someone extraneous or someone very close to your subject. For instance, writing about Pauline Bonaparte, why not write about the Emperor Napoleon, who is infinitely fascinating? Well, one good reason is there are a host of people better qualified to do so and some very fine books. But I think that it's important to show them warts and all, as the phrase is. But where I say you're the critical champion is when you're pointing up their failings, you're interested where that failing weakness drives them, where it might originate from, just as you're interested in their strengths. So I think you are looking at them objectively. It is probably an unpleasant task to spend four or five years writing about someone you dislike. And I haven't done that, but some biographers have come to dislike the people they write about. And that's unfortunate. There are, I think, times when I've been writing each of the biographies I've produced that I've been dismayed by my subject's conduct and even repelled. But that's part of almost like a long friendship with them. You're looking at every inch of their life. They're hardly going to be solid virtue all the way through. And if they were, I'm afraid I probably wouldn't be writing about them. So can one really be objective about them? I think in a way you've already chosen to write about them from a huge cast of other characters. So you've made some kind of you know, commitment to them. And I think it's that commitment that matters. 
I mean, I recently read the second volume of a very fine, I think it's going to be a three-part biography of Hitler, which was fascinating about the development of his cult during the 1920s and told me all sorts of, I mean, it made me understand the times and the man more. The biographer in question was in no way condoning the cult, but he was showing sort of how it happened and what the personality of Hitler was during that time as it, the development of his character, which fostered this cult. But I write about people who interest me and, in a sense, are not minor characters, but they interest me or the subjects, like the marriage of George Martha Washington attracted me because I wanted to know about it and I couldn't find a book to tell me about it. So I, even though I'm a Brit, I was greatly daring and wrote it. And in a sense, unlikely to fall out of love with any of the people I'm writing about because I've never been in love with them. I'm just interested by them. For a We've talked a lot about history and biography and specifically about how biographers rely on a lot of historical methods to do their work, like rigorous research. But we haven't yet talked about the real differences between history and biography. So I'm curious, do you see other similarities between the two genres? And where do you, as a professional biographer, see the differences between the genres? I mean, what for you makes history history and biography biography? I think the difference is and I go back to it, that you are telling the arc of a human life. So that is your focus. And in history, it's the narrative sweep. It may only be of a year of the Civil War, or it might be a great history of China. And that can be wonderful biographical portraits. I know of a very fine book, Thinking of China's War with Japan, 1937 to 45, by Professor Rana Mitter. He's a professor of Chinese history here at Oxford, and there are very fine biographical portraits. Another professor, Margaret Macmillan, here has written on the personalities, very fine history involving portraits of the personalities at the close of the First World War. So you can have history which has got a biographical force to it. But I very much regard myself, first and foremost, as a writer, and then as a writer who writes historical biography. I wouldn't, and still more narrowly focused, a writer who writes 18th century historical biography. I like the way people wrote then. I think probably the early influence of Jane Austen on every British young teenager had much to do with it, although there was also a writer of historical fiction, Georgette Hare, who wrote rather more books than Jane Austen, so I read all of those too. I love reading history. I've been fortunate for the past few years to be a judge on an American military history prize, and it's a huge pleasure to me to read history, but I know that I want to tell the story of people. Wasn't that an enjoyable conversation? It was really interesting to hear Flora talk about her childhood, how she came to study and write about women, and about all the work she puts into crafting a good biography. Now, if you enjoy biography, you should really listen to or revisit the Doing History biography series. It's just four episodes, episodes 209 through 212, and it really helps us understand what we find so captivating about the genre, as well as how biographers and historians approach the work of biography. Now, I've created show notes for this episode. They include more information about Flora, her books, plus notes for what we talked about today. benfranklinsworld.com slash 240. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's Digital Projects team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Emily Sneff, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. That awesome music you heard throughout the show that was composed by Breakmaster Cylinder. Finally, what biographies have you read that you've really enjoyed? Any figure, any time period. I just really love to know. <laughs>
Liz at BenFranklin'sWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute.